Engineers in Western Australia have reached a milestone in their bid to build the first wave energy farm in the world. After five years on the drawing board, they're finally building the underwater plant to power a naval base at Garden Island. The idea is to prove up the technology for a rollout on a much bigger scale, taking advantage of Australia's enviable wave power resource. But there's concern with cuts to clean energy programs that the expertise will head offshore. Claire Moody has the story. For these two Perth engineers, the ocean's their playground, but it's also their livelihood. We're very lucky in Australia. We've got the, the Southern Ocean delivering swell here every day of the week. While weekends are spent riding the waves, work time is spent gauging their potential. You need enthusiasm uh, as much as optimism. We feel the eyes of the world watching. They've spent the last six years fine-tuning a technology to harness energy from the ocean. And today the team is getting a bird's eye view of their underwater wave farm actually being built. Five kilometres off the WA coast, the technology is being installed to supply electricity and desalinated water to the naval base at Garden Island, southwest of Perth. It's the first time that any company has ever deployed multiple wave energy units into what's called a wave farm and produced electricity and, and fresh water as well from that. And this is how it'll work. That boy moves with the waves, generates uh, high, high amounts of hydraulic pressure, which are delivered ashore through a pipe. And once that high pressure water is on shore, it's used to spin a hydroelectric turbine to generate electricity, but also used to power a desalination plant to produce fresh water. It's one of three wave energy pilot projects in the pipeline in Australia, but the only so-called wave farm comprising multiple units. The nice thing about wave energy is that it uh, runs day and night and it's very predictable. The idea is to prove up the wave technology so that it can become a major player in the energy market. The resource that Southern Australia gets is absolutely massive. Um, uh, one way to think about it is if we could just harvest 10% of that energy, uh, it would supply half of Australia's electricity. But with Australia's abundance of fossil fuels like coal, that's not likely to happen any time soon. We have seen in the last few years a lot of technologies fall by the wayside, um, and that's not necessarily a reflection on the technology or even the company. Uh, the fact of the matter is this is really hard. And according to the clean energy industry, it's just got a lot harder. Every renewable energy policy mechanism or funding source that I can think of has either recently been cut completely, cut significantly, or exists in a complete cloud of uncertainty at the moment. And that's having the effect of virtually halting investment in renewable energy in this country. Of the $100 million being spent on this technology, 13 millions come from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, which is facing a funding cut under the carbon tax repeal legislation. And while that won't threaten this project, future projects are in doubt. I think the mood in renewable energy in Australia right now is sombre, um, to say the least. And really, um, that is due to significant policy uncertainty in the space. The government says the agency will still have two and a half billion dollars to spend and others in the energy sector agree it's enough, saying the uptake of expensive renewables needs to be slowed down. This WA company supplies electricity to industry mainly from coal and gas. Power prices have gone up big time in the last few years and there is a limit to where the public may be able to handle the cost uh, increases. So I think politically it's probably cautious and efficient to take a pause, you know, have a, a consideration and whether to pursue more renewable development. But the Sustainable Energy Association warns while the government hits the pause button, there could be an unwanted spin-off. 
Australia really runs the risk of losing our innovators, our project financiers, our project developers to offshore locations where there is support for renewable energy. As a result of the support, say, that the UK government and, and European countries are currently providing in wave and tidal, uh, most of the companies have migrated to that part of the world and, and particularly in the tidal sector there's many companies there now that are really at the cusp of commercialisation. For the time being at least, the team behind the Perth Wave Energy project isn't going anywhere. They're focused on flicking the switch at Garden Island mid-next year. We recently uh, had a, a team activity where we talked about that day and um, we compared it to the, the, the recent rover landing on, on Mars and the jubilation of the team when, when it landed safely and I think that's uh, it's going to be a similar day for uh, the team here. The company does have global ambitions. It's already secured overseas funds to develop projects in both Ireland and on the French territory of Reunion Island. If we can keep the core and the heart of the technology here and export the technology from Perth, that would be a fantastic outcome. For these innovators, the politics of green power might slow the progression towards wave energy in Australia, but it's the science that will justify its future. If we can be producing 10 or 20 per cent of Australia's electricity in the next 30 or 40 years, then, um, then we've been successful in our jobs here at Carnegie.